Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This is a really good show that we have planned for you today, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. So yeah, let's get to it. My guest today is a former national journalist turned PR guy and a story obsessive entrepreneur. Back in 2010, along with his wife, they started Arc7 Communications. It's a PR agency focused on the healthcare industry. With their agency running smoothly, he wanted to help entrepreneurs and startups tell their story. So he created Class PR to democratize PR and help businesses tell their stories better. In this conversation, we discuss how to write a press release, the value of perseverance, and paying attention to the details. Now, let's hack Alistair Clay. Before we get going with today's interview, I have a question for you. Have you ever considered starting your own business or launching a startup? If the answer is yes, which I'm assuming it is, then you're probably going to want a great logo as well as business cards and a website and a whole bunch of graphic design needs you will have. Well, this is where designcrowd.com can help. And thankfully, they're today's sponsor. Here's how DesignCrowd works. First thing is you just have to visit designcrowd.com slash hack and you post a brief describing the design you need. Just let's say a brand new logo. Then DesignCrowd will open your project to their 550,000 designers to respond. Step three, within hours, you will begin receiving designs. And over the course of three to 10 days, a typical project will receive 60 to over 100 different designs from designers around the world. Last step, you just have to pick the best design and the designers get paid. Plus, you're covered. If you don't find a design you want from the 60 to 100 you've been given, no problem. Design Crowd has an absolute money back guarantee. Crowdsourcing design on Design Crowd helps you get access to the collective creativity of hundreds of thousands of designers and it will save you money, time, and it'll help you find the best design possible for your budget. Plus, they want to give you $100 off your very first project for being a Hack the Entrepreneur listener. Check out designcrowd.com slash hack right now. And that $100 off your first project is waiting for you. Once again, that's designcrowd.com slash hack. We are back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur. And today we have a very, very, very special guest. Alistair, welcome to the show. Hi there. Good to be here, Johnny. Oh, I, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. It's really cool that you reached out to me with a great story, which we'll get to in a bit. But I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So should we jump into it? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Alistair, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? I guess there are many things, as I'm sure everybody says that, but I think the one thing that really has helped me on my journey to be an entrepreneur is attention to detail. Now, that might sound slightly boring, but I think that's it is so important to kind of achieve success because as an entrepreneur, you get very excited about the result you're after and this big shining thing on the hill that you're aiming towards. And sometimes that can be a distraction. And if you're not focusing on the tiny details of every single action that you're taking, then you never kind of get to the result that you're after. So I think for me, I guess this comes from my background as a journalist, you know, attention to detail was everything. And so when we're, uh, you know, we're building our company recently, Class PR, I found that especially with digital businesses, there are so many moving parts there. And it's sometimes it's tempting to want to leap ahead, to want to rush ahead. And attention to detail is the thing that, you know, and I guess patience that comes with that is the thing that really for me sets sets those people apart who succeed from those who perhaps don't. And I think twinned with attention to detail to every 
element of the journey you're on is actually perseverance as well. I think as an entrepreneur, you need those two things equally. You need that, that attention to detail in whatever kind of particular task you're working on at a time. And then you need that perseverance to keep going with those things to get to your goal to, and then beyond that, as you continue to improve and to kind of to, to develop it. But I think that's something that I've really, I guess, as formerly as a journalist, you know, I was a bit of a headlines boy and, you know, you get excited by the big story, but I think if you really want to build something, if you really want to build a house, if you really want to build something, then you've got to kind of put focus into every step of the journey. And then the kind of the result comes on its own. You absolutely know where you're heading, you know, the vision that you want to, to achieve. But you really need to have that focus in every single small act that you take. And if you bring that focus, you're much more likely to get to where you want to get. And I think that's the thing that I've really learnt along my entrepreneurial thing that I think has given a bit of a competitive advantage. So focus, details, patience, perseverance, Mm -hmm. absolutely essential. Is there ever in the back of your head concern that sometimes too much focus on the detail or that perseverance, not so much perseverance, I guess, but that focus on details and getting things like that sort of concern about worrying about perfection before launching something out into the world. Yeah, I think there is a balance to be struck between kind of the continuity to achieve something like you don't get anything right without putting in effort and really working hard to achieve that result. But it needs to be twinned with flexibility as well. Because of course, I'm not saying that, you know, I came up with a business idea, like say class PR and then rigidly stuck to a plan to get there in a year's time or whatever. You have to adapt all the time and pivot and be flexible. And so I think the the trick is to find that balance point between the focus, the perseverance, but also the flexibility as well. And so, because yeah, you don't want to be locked into a vision that's never going to work. You need to adapt to the information that you're getting as you build that business, as you develop that business. But I think a curse of some entrepreneurs is the kind of shiny new thing that, you know, one month it's exciting, you pick it up and it's brilliant. And then your attention wanders onto the next thing and you kind of don't achieve anything perhaps. And so that's something that I've had to, and I've put myself in that category. So I've had to learn to kind of, to kind of focus on, on what I'm doing and, but with a flexible mindset at the same time. And I think if you can bring those two things together, then that's the magic ingredient, I think. Yeah. And so I like that. The idea that you sort of realized it within yourself and then had to work to change it and alleviate that problem of just, oh, there's the next thing, there's the next thing, and never actually having that sort of continuity to complete. Definitely. And I tell you what, that probably comes from 10 years at the beginning of my career working as a journalist. Because every day as a journalist, working on the national news is like a brand new story. It's a shiny new thing every day. It's a thrill. It's like, right, let's get this story. We've got this, I don't know, like a a crime story or a business story or a celebrity nonsense story or whatever, but whatever story you're working on, you know, it's the big thing for that day, you get it done. And then the next day there's something new. And so that is, I guess that's a dopamine high as well. (laughs) You know, it's sort of, there's always something sort of new and shiny to work on and moving from that to build my own businesses. I mean, this is the second business that I've built class PR. It requires you to bring the best of that mindset that I learned back then, which was attention to detail and kind of really getting into the facts and the juice of a story and really interrogating the information that was in front of me. But then if you're building something, if you're building a business, that's not something you complete every day. So you have to be able to then bring some kind of patience and longer view into it than rather just what's going to make a headline in the next 24 hours. (laughs) Yeah, I've never actually thought of journalists in that way, that they get to chase that new story every single day. That's it. Yeah, (laughs) that's pretty cool. And so I've had almost 400 people now on the show. Mm -hmm. I believe you, Alistair, are the first journalist to entrepreneur. Like I've had people who went to journalism school, but never were really journalists as a career and then made Mm -hmm. the pivot over. Mm -hmm. But you've done it and run a successful agency and now Mm -hmm. a new business. Mm -hmm. What, What was it like that? Was there some sort of pivotal moment or what caused you to want to leave that career that you had Uh obviously gone to school, worked, built up, and then I want to go into PR myself. I think actually, I mean, if you want to go back to like the roots in my childhood without getting sort of too Freudian here, (laughs) but I, um, I always had that entrepreneurial spirit. Definitely, definitely. So 
you know, when I was kind of 12, 13, I was too young to get a job in my local pub. So I thought, how can I earn some money? So I set up like a gardening business in my local village by putting leaflets through everybody's doors. And so I, I love to kind of think, how can I kind of create some income here? And so I, I mean, I know that's a tiny little example, but it was a, that was clearly in me at that very early age. And then in the early days of the internet in like the late nineties, I uh, came up with this idea for an online sort of student finance business called out of the red.com. This was still while I was at university. It didn't come off, but I had this, still had this kind of entrepreneurial desire then. And then as I kind of went through college, through university, I came out at the end and thought, well, Christ, you know, what am I, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I thought, do you know what? I think I'll get a skill. I'll just, so I just, I'd always enjoy journalism and everything, but it wasn't like I came out of the womb sort of shouting, hold the front page. I thought it would just be a good skill to have. So I kind of went into journalism and I loved it. And it was such a brilliant trade to go into because it teaches you the ability, like I say, to work to insanely tight deadlines, to distill complex information down into its core constituent parts, to, to really focus on the detail and to put yourself in high pressure situations. And so I kind of did that for the best part of 10 years. But in the back of my mind, there was always, if I'm honest, I saw journalists around me and I just thought, I'm not quite them. I'm not quite somebody who would, and there is a real type, especially, you know, I was on the the Daily Mirror and the Independent, which are big national newspapers in the UK. And there is a real DNA type to a journalist. And, you know, they are, they just have an incredible hunger. And um, I had that, but not to the degree I think that my colleagues around me had. And that there was something else in me that I felt I had to satisfy. And so my first step was to move away from journalism into PR. And I, I went to become head of press at a big international aid charity called Plan. I think it's quite big in Canada, actually, Plan International. But then in the back of my mind, I, th I just wanted to work for myself. I wanted to do it myself. I kind of, I just I didn't like answering to other people. And which is probably one of the reasons I went into journalism as well, because, you know, okay, you answer to your news editor and your editor, but ultimately you're judged by the stories you bring in and you kind of work on your own. So I always had this desire to kind of set up my own business. It was always there. And I felt that I got some really good core skills from being a journalist. So at the time was right at around about 2010 to set up a PR agency. So I set up my first PR agency with my wife, actually, Arc7. She'd worked in PR in London as well. And that agency became a, a real success pretty quickly. We focused mainly on healthcare, but I think it became a success because the combination of our skills, I'd come from a journalism background, she'd come from an agency background, and yeah, we built a really successful PR agency. But again, as I kind of, that, as that matured, and that business is a huge success now, it was, I started to think, you know, I started to listen to podcasts like yours and started to look at other types of models for selling knowledge rather than selling time. And yeah, the idea came along to, to set up Class PR and it was like, ah, oh, this feels like a really exciting entrepreneurial venture. So it's been, yeah, I think it's that spark has always been there in me to do my own thing and to be creative, actually, because the greatest buzz I get is from tapping into that creative energy, whether it's writing a great story, whether it's interviewing a really interesting person, whether it's you know, building a business. For me, that's the thing that makes it good to feel alive is that, is that creative energy. You know, when you use that energy, that part of your brain, and then after yeah. you know, a, good, <laughs> a good couple of hours, you're like, oh, yeah, I feel nourished by that. that was, that's that's kind of how I got where I got. <laughs> and so seven years on, and you said with ARC7 that it's, yeah. it's a healthcare PR agency. Yeah, that's right. Like, was it from day one a healthcare PR agency? Honestly, no. So basically, I, so I left the, the newsroom and we set up our own agency. And first of all, you know, we had a few, we had an elaborate and beautiful business plan, which, <laughs> which yeah. went on to be completely ignored. And we thought we were going to be working in certain sectors like renewables and things like this. And then a few clients came along at the beginning who worked in healthcare. And, and I really, there was a particular, there were a couple of clients who I particularly enjoyed working with because although they had big financial backing behind them, they're essentially startups. And I love energy of a startup, this kind of leanness. And if you've got a great idea and you can put it into action, then go and do it. And our first few clients in that sector that just kind of happened to find us online and through and had heard good things about us, they worked like that. And so I thought, actually, I like working with these types of people. And I like working with these types of businesses. And we, so we started to work for organizations that work with people like supply support services for people with learning disabilities and autism and dementia. And it felt pretty rewarding as well to help these organizations put themselves on the map and to show the positive difference they were making in the world for people who lead pretty challenging lives at times, frankly. 
Yeah. And so I think part of me is like you have a plan for a business and that's great. But also, as I just said in my first answer, you remain flexible as well. And if opportunities come along, then exploit them. Yeah, you have to. And and it's kind of getting a whole bunch of clients and finding sort of the ones that fit best with you. And then being exactly. like, I actually want more of these clients. Yeah, yeah, But yeah. to sit there from still and not actually have any clients and assume which ones you want is pretty hard. Very. And, and for me, it's about almost like the type of people I work with is almost more important than what they do. Because I get a buzz out of working with people who have got that real creative, can-do energy. And those were the people we met in healthcare, first of all. And so I thought, well, yeah, you know, I want to work with these people. Sometimes you could, I don't know, you maybe you could work with a fashion label or something like that. And the product is beautiful and glamorous or whatever. But the people you're working with, then they don't have share your values or whatever. So I would rather work with people with shared values. Those are the types of clients I want to work with because great clients are just you want to work harder for them as well. And, and then you get more out of it and everybody benefits if you're really bringing value. And I think that's what I realized with Arc7 is that there's a lot about, when, especially when you work online, how do you grow your list, give away value and all this sort of stuff. And I think that's kind of, I don't know, a slightly disingenuous way to look at it. I think the giving value to your clients should just be so natural that it just, you just want to do it. And then the success, the, the new clients just come as a result of that. And that's something that with our new business, that I've really enjoyed doing is like how, you know, there are people out there who need advice on how to position their businesses, how to grow the awareness and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, I've got experience, I've got value. Let's make it available to them. Yeah. That's kind of how we've got to uh, where we are now. So let's talk about the new business in sort of the context of like projects, which it's a huge project, but you've for seven years building, growing, running a successful agency. And now Uh doing something completely to this, well, not completely separated, but it is. Well, it's yeah. <laughs> within the same, I mean, realm, and obviously your expertise, it's not like you're teaching people to be auto mechanics or something now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But with, I'm sure, a lot of pressure on time and resources mm-hmm. from what you're already doing, plus mm-hmm. having a family and such, mm-hmm. what sort of process did you go through just initially to decide that, even jumping into a whole new business like Class PR was worth mm. your personal time, energy, and resources? Gosh, that's a good question. So I think my wife and I, like I say, we've run our business together. And, and, and initially, I'd say this was her idea. You know, she kind of had the first inklings of the idea for Class PR. She's a huge podcast fan, and she'd been listening to the likes of you and JLD and Pat Flynn. And, you know, we thought, how can we sell our knowledge instead of our time? And you're right, you know, this essentially the knowledge and the experience that we sell through that we make available through class PR is the same sort of knowledge that we make available through our traditional agency arc seven, but it is a completely different business. You're absolutely right. It's an online training business. So it's totally different. I love a challenge. And I mean, that's not, you know, we are insanely busy, you know, arc seven keeps us, keeps us very busy. And, but I just thought, how can we do something differently? And also everything's changing so fast. The traditional agency model is really changing. Big agencies, I think, are finding themselves in a lot of trouble because they have huge overheads and people, clients want more specialist boutique agencies these days. And so I thought we need to make, we need to create a different, another business here that operates on an entirely different model. So if the traditional agency model becomes less viable or extinct even say in 10 years time i want to have something else going on that allows us to sell out this awesome knowledge that we've gained over all these years and so looking around and like listening to podcasts and seeing how people were selling knowledge and their kind of wisdom it made me think yeah we can we can do this and it would be an awesome challenge to see how we could build an online community with a training course element and i think and the challenge at the beginning was how do you teach something like pr which a lot of people see sometimes more as an art than a science and there's a lot of confusion about what it is is it just getting media coverage is it just getting on you know in blogs and podcasts or whereas we approach it from it's all about knowing what your story is as a business and then how you engage with all your different audiences and yes that may mean media coverage but it could also mean how to pull together a great pitch for an investor our challenge was how to work how could you model the process of doing pr so you could put it into an online training course in a complete novice could follow steps one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And then at the end of that process, they can PR their business. They can find the stories in their business. They understand how to shape them. They understand how to pitch them. They understand 
how newsworthy are, what types of media to talk to, how to talk to the media, how to talk to bloggers and podcasters. And it was the challenge of thinking, could you model the process of PR? Could we kind of reverse engineer the hundreds of campaigns we'd worked on and put together like a recipe that anybody could follow? And how can we scale that? How can we get out to the startup and entrepreneur community? Because I've worked with a lot of startups and something I observed was that they often had awesome stories to tell, but lacked the resources to spend thousands of pounds a month on a PR agency. Or frankly, and I'll be honest, sometimes we're being, getting investment and going immediately onto the books of PR agency, spending a huge amount of their investment and not getting enough for it. And when they didn't need to, and actually as a startup, you need to know what your story is. It's critical to the success of your business. It's not a fluffy add-on. It's something that you really should learn to do because it will set you apart from the competition. And so I wanted to, of course, I want to build a successful business, but I know that we, because we've done it, I know that we can help startups and entrepreneurs fix a problem at low cost that they face. So yes, it's been many, many (laughs) months of working late into the night with a small baby and a toddler and where my business partner is my wife as well. So I won't lie, it's been intense at times. And also taking our knowledge and experience onto a purely digital platform has been a steep learning curve for us. Really has. It really has. And but it's been so worth it. And now we're at a point where we're kind of, you know, we're launching and we've been like testing with loads of audiences and the response we're getting is fantastic. It feels worthwhile. But it's it's been an interest feels more of an entrepreneurial venture than than building the more traditional agency. That's kind of, that felt a bit easier in a way because it's like, you know, the mo- it's such a proven model, whereas this still feels like a bit like the brave new world for, especially in the PR industry. And I liken it to a few months ago, you know, I felt like I was sort of swimming, thought, you know, I was a, a, a huge lake and I thought one day it was a great idea to swim across. And now I was halfway across and I couldn't see the shore. And I was thinking, is it still a good idea? And, um, but now we're definitely on the other shore and it's, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And, and like I say, I love, yeah, it's running two businesses is full on, but, but it's also immensely rewarding. And my wife was always telling me I need to do more. So, <laughs> <laughs> so something that really stood out to me in there is this idea of story yeah. for startups, for companies. And to me, that's kind of a foreign concept thinking about story mm-hmm. and like, let me get this straight. Are you talking about story for a new company? Are you talking about like the features and the benefits mm-hmm. of their new product? Yeah, it can be. I mean, all elements of the business, there will be stories buried in your business, in anybody's business. And so the stories that we help businesses find are ones that they can use with their internal audiences to get media coverage, to use in their Facebook advertising campaigns. What we, one of the, the starting point for the famous course, the course that we run is, is something called a story finder. And it's for some of your listeners who may have used the business model canvas, it's kind of inspired by that. It's a one page document, which breaks down your business into the five core elements. So from your company structure, which is kind of your, your financing, the model by which you run your business across to your team. So that's your founder. And if you're a startup, it might just be you or your kind of your partners. Then across to your daily operations, that's number three. So it's like, how does the business run on a day-to-day basis? Number four, your value proposition. So what is the service? What is the product that you are making? What is it that you actually sell? And then finally, fifth, your customers. Who are they? What experience have they had? What, you know, how many do you have? What impact have you had on them? How have you transformed their lives? And if you break down your business, your startup into those five different areas, And you then start to ask the questions about what is new here? What is innovative? What is disruptive? What is a first either within my geography or within the whole country or within our sector? You will start to find things that will be of interest to your different audiences. I mean, as you go through our process, you know, part of that is finding out who your audiences are and and the messages you want to get to them. But if you look at your business in this really kind of structured way, you can start to find the things that are going to be of interest to your different audiences. And how you can construct stories around them. Because stories, you know, online, the world now is an incredibly information overloaded place. It's not just enough to say you have a great product. You need to make an an emotional connection with your audiences. And so you need to find stories that are going to do that. So to give you some examples, 
starting with the company structure, you may have just received a huge amount of investment from a famous VC or an angel or something. Well, that's a business story that you need to be sharing with your business audiences because it proves you are credible. It proves that you are investable and that you are somebody who needs to be acknowledged and, and taken note of. Your team as a founder, you will have a personal story. You know, you're drilling in my, into mine today. Why have you done this? What did you do before? What's your motivation? Media or your, your, your own audiences through your website, you know, you want to be sharing your story of why you've done this and, and how you've sweated to do it and the sacrifices you made to make it happen. Your value proposition, the service, what actually is it? What's new about it? You know, we did a story once with a, work for a company who were the first company to stream audiobooks. So they were kind of like Spotify for audiobooks. And so they were a first because they didn't invent streaming. They didn't invent audiobooks, but they kind of were the first in that space to stream audiobooks. So they, they had something new, something innovative, something disruptive. And then their audiences would want to know about that. And then in terms of your customers, say for you, maybe your listeners, what impact have you had on your listeners say, and how are their stories something that you want to share because, you know, people who listen to Hack the Entrepreneur have done X, Y, and Z, or you could survey your listeners and find out how many of them have set up businesses or what, what success they've had, or just very particular human interest stories about somebody who left the rat race and now has a successful online cheese selling business or something. There are stories of all elements of a person's business. And people overlook so many because they think, oh, no one care about that one. That's not really a story. But when you understand how to really find those stories in your business and to understand what makes something newsworthy, what makes something attractive to a particular audience, it's amazing how much is there right now on day one of, say, launch or pre-launch and throughout the life of the business as it grows and evolves. And people care about this stuff. You know, it's the content it, that you're going to need to, yes, get great media coverage so you get credibility of being in high profile media and being on the best blogs and podcasts but also the awareness and also then, you know, your own media channels, your website, your social media, your Facebook advertising campaigns, that all needs content based on stories and telling great stories is as old as the hills. You know, we did it <laughs> tens of thousands of years ago, but it's, it's something that I think entrepreneurs, when they learn to do it, it really, often you see a light bulb go in their head and they go, oh, right. So this audience will care about that. Therefore, I need to emphasize that more in my marketing or I need to talk about that more or actually that's, an, that's a particular issue that we can own. And yeah, it can be transformative and it can actually change how people run their businesses. It's, and, and I love to see that when the kind of the penny really drops. And um, we, we were working with uh, one of the people who've been through the course run a kind of like gourmet soup company. And we actually help them kind of prepare as well to go on Dragon's Den, which is a bit like Shark Tank over in the US. I'm not sure what your version. We have Dragon's Den in Canada. Dragon's Den. Too. Okay. So. so they went through that. They were successful. They got investment. But like, as they were preparing for that, no point in their story were they talking about the fact that like the guy who actually created the soups, the recipes for the soup was a Michelin star trained chef. That's a core element of their story that sets them apart. Sometimes when you're so close to your business, it's like you don't see the truth that's right in front of your nose and turning on this kind of story, journalistic radar really helps you look at your business in a new way. And then using this story, so not in your own internal marketing, but for mm -hmm. outreach to PR, say, mm -hmm. are you like, if we find the story, should that become like simply a press release or should mm -hmm. we almost be trying to write the story for the journalists? So that's a good question. And the answer is kind of both. So there's a lot of, am I allowed to swear on your podcast? Yeah, of course. <laughs> there's a lot of BS out there <laughs> about the term press release. Okay. So, you know, in the digital age, it's kind of received a lot of a lot of abuse, I would say. And that's because something that I, I come from a journalistic background and I used to get tens and tens of press releases a week, poorly written documents where it was impenetrable, where there was actually a news story that literally you would just hit delete instantly as soon as you read the first word. And those press releases still, still to this day continue to be created and they are an abomination and should be banned. I get um, lots of them every day in my yeah, inbox. <laughs> yeah, and, and that for me is that's not a press release. Okay, so as part of the course that we have, you learn how to write a genuinely newsworthy press release, which is in fact a news story. And so more often than not, it's pretty much copy and pasted into your target media or, to, or slightly tweaked for your target blog, depending on the tone, because you need to know how to have that top line, that intro of like 20 words max that completely articulates your story, not in a hyperbolic way, but in a way that is compelling and completely grabs somebody's attention. And frankly, if they didn't read another paragraph after that, 
it's in those first 20 words. And that is one hell of a skill to develop, I can tell you. And it's something that that if you have that ability to, you know, what was it? Was it Winston Churchill? Oh, I can't remember who it was, who said, if I had the time, I'd write you a short letter. It's that, <laughs> it's that ability to be able to distill a huge amount of information into the only the essential pieces. And so if you can do that, then yes, you should create a press release. But please don't think this is some sort of old style, just list of information full of, you know, hyped up language of the world's greatest tech company launched today and blah, blah, blah. blah. It's like, just tell me what the story is. Tell me what you don't need to hype it. Just if you can find the news value in it, that it's disruptive in a particular way, or it has a first, or it's a new thing, or it's particularly inspiring or moving, just tell that story. And yes, put it down in a press release form, because I can guarantee if you send a journalist or a blogger or a podcaster a properly worded, and you're right, it's, uh, you're actually writing the news story for them. We call it a press release, but it is a news story. <laughs> you create that for them, they will love you for it because everybody loves someone who makes their life easier. And if you can help them immediately see the story without getting advertorial in tone, salesy in tone, but hey, you know what? This is just a great story. Then you're much more likely to have success in terms of media relations, blogger outreach, podcaster outreach. And frankly, you know, those skills will serve you well through any of your communications. So old style press releases, I spit on your grave. <laughs> but proper, but proper news style press releases that is a news story first and foremost, because a journalist, and also there's this, there was, I think tradition has been this distinction between old, old school mainstream journalists here and bloggers here and podcasters here. Yeah, they're slightly different, but at the end of the day, they all want great stories. They all want something that connects with them emotionally. And they make that decision incredibly quickly, incredibly quickly. You know, you'll literally read an intro and go, yes or no, on the whole. And so if you can distill that information into a really strong news story, then that's going to put you way ahead of your competition, way ahead of your competition. And, and like I say, it will ser- that skill will serve you well in many areas of your business. So when I'm writing an article, this first sort of 20 words is called the lead. Mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. it not? Yeah, lead, trove, yeah, yeah. That's the part that kind of has to bring people in. Like it has to be, has to tell you enough about it to draw you in and catch you. Because if it doesn't catch you right there in those first 20 words, I'm not going to read the article. Exactly, exactly. And so, I mean, when I was learning to be a journalist all those years ago, I would sometimes stare at a blank screen for an hour trying to write those first 20 words. But when those 20 words came, then the rest just fell straight out of that. Have, getting, getting that intro, getting that lead right is absolutely critical. And as, you know, as we all know, people's attention span online is, is really short. Yeah, you've got, you've got to be able to, to grab them quickly. And even if you are, you see, I think there's a really good discipline in creating a press release, even to send to, say, a radio interview or a podcaster who is not going to print your press release. But because it's a story, first and foremost, they read that story and they go, yeah, I, I, let's, get this, let's get this person on the show. They sound really interesting. So all you're doing is distilling your stories into a really easy to consume format for people. And, you know, in our course, we've created like an awesome template that literally is a one page document that kind of has the boxes there and tells you what needs to go in which bit of the story. So you present your story in the right order at the right speed with the the, the right number of hooks that you're going to get somebody's attention. I want this template, Alistair. Uh, You can get it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so this, we're going to get back to class PR and sort of the pitch about it shortly, but I do want to wrap up on this one final question for you, if I could. Yeah. So after talking to hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs, it seems to be this sort of entrepreneurial gap that we live in, meaning that no matter what we accomplish personally and within our businesses, it seems like we always push our successes into the future, meaning that in three months, when you hit that revenue metric with class PR, or in six months, when ARC7 hits as that other like success mm-hmm. metrics that you set seconds before you hit those goals, you're going to set bigger, loftier ones <laughs> into the future. From the outside, you can look super successful, but to me, it's like walking towards the horizon. The further you walk, the further away the horizon always gets. Mm-hmm. So you've come an absolute long way, Alistair, like since you were 12, 13 years old, <laughs> wanting to start since starting out of the red, I believe you called it, dot yeah, com, yeah, yeah. going to school becoming a journalist, going into PR, and now starting an absolutely successful PR agency, and now into your second business. Uh-huh. 
Rather than looking forward right now, Alistair, I would love it if you could stop, turn around, and look behind you at this whole sort of crazy journey that you've chosen to take and tell me how you feel about it up until today. Gosh, that is a good question. How do I feel about it? It's been wild ride. <laughs> I think, God, that is a good question. I... It's yeah, it's been a thrill and it's been and it's gone fast. And I think what surprised me is how much you can kind of achieve over the space of like five years. Like you can you can just do so much. And when you're kind of in the day to day, you think, oh, we're not moving that that, that far forward. Or as you just said, you know, we should be further forward. We should be hitting this metric. But then when you look back over a slightly longer period, like five years, you go, my God, think where we were then. We didn't know this. We didn't know that. We didn't have these clients. We didn't do this. We weren't at these levels. And now we're here. So I think you're right that that's, it's really uh, healthy to, to kind of do that and to kind of give yourself some perspective to kind of look back down the mountain and go, actually, we're really high up at the moment. <laughs> and, and, and something, and I mean, life just happens so fast as well. And my, my wife is a far more wise, clever, calm person than I am. And, you know, she's always talking about you know, it sounds a bit cheesy, but you know, the path is the way. And it really is about enjoying every day of, 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 of this entrepreneurial journey of your life, because it is, I'm like that. It is too easy to go when we've done this, everything will be great. Or when we've achieved this, everything will be great. And actually, I think if you're not actually enjoying the day to day of doing your business, of building your business, I actually don't think you'll get to where you want to get. <laughs> because if you're just kind of doing it, with like, okay, this is shit today. But do you know what? When we get, when we've sold the 5,000th course or whatever, then it'll be good. Then it'll be good. Then I think that attitude in the moment won't get you to where you want to get. So I think you have to really like work hard, but like don't take too seriously and enjoy. And then you're more likely to get to where you want to get. So sorry, it's a slightly roundabout answer to your question. <laughs> no, and it ties back in perfectly to your first answer which was perseverance patience and attention yeah. to detail <laughs> it's true it's true it's all sounding quite buddhist <laughs> so you've so you've piqued my interest and i'm sure the listeners about class pr can you <laughs> now sort of just specifically tell them what it is how they could get it and where they can find it so class pr is basically an online training school for startups entrepreneurs small businesses who want to take control of their own pr so they can get Great media coverage, getting the great blogs, podcasts, and really learn where the stories are in their business so they, they can grow their business, get massive awareness and credibility. So to check it out, you can go to class-pr.com. There are tons of free resources there. So we've got our daily PR hacks with myself and also Gemma Clay, my wife and far more intelligent half, where we give kind of daily tips on how to, 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 to PR your business. I've also got a podcast called The Famous Business, where I speak to businesses and find out how they've basically grown their awareness and built their audiences. So there's lots of really interesting stories there about that you can learn from, basically. You know, I love to learn from other people. We've got some PR products there as well, where you can kind of get one-to-one -one coaching. But crucially, we've got our course, which is called The Famous Course. Now, this is the online course, which you can do over six weeks, or you could binge watch it. There's 10 modules. And it introduces the famous formula. That is a proven step-by-step -step method that takes you from complete PR novice to understand where the stories are in your business, who your audiences are, what your messages are, how to work out how newsworthy they are, how to create, write that brilliant news, that brilliant press release, how to pitch the sorts of responses you might get from the media, and then how to really maximize the impact of media coverage, blog coverage, podcast coverage. So there's a whole, literally, we took the process of doing PR after doing it for years and reverse engineered it and created a method, a formula and an algorithm, if you want to get all tech speak, that anybody can follow. And that is called Famous. So you can go to class-pr.com and sign up to the course. You get like the whole 10 modules. And what's really interesting is you're not just watching slides or some sort of catatonic keynote. You are you're watching a classroom of businesses just like you go through this. So we found, we ran a competition to find 10 awesome businesses from across the UK, put them in a hotel for a week, put them in a studio and put them through this famous formula. And so you watch them learn, asking the questions that you would ask, having the problems that you would have. And so that you really feel as much as possible, like you are in the room. And then alongside watching and, and downloading all the templates and PDFs, doing the online course, you then get monthly Facebook Lives where you can ask questions directly to, to myself and to Gemma about problems or challenges that you're having, and we will answer your individual questions. 
And then there's the the Facebook community as well, the Class PR community, which has surprised me how successful that's been, how businesses are really kind of learning from one another. It's lovely to see as they support each other. So you've got that whole product there. And um, yeah, the ones, the guys who've been through it have had awesome results, got big national, international media coverage. It's changed the way they've done their businesses. And it's an insanely low price. (laughs) So go to uh, class-pr.com and click on courses and check us out. Very cool. Very cool. I will link to that in the show notes on Hack the Entrepreneur for you, as well as the famous business podcast. We talked about Dragon's Den, which is a Canadian and British Mm -hmm. versions of a show that I'll also link to. And arc7.co.uk is the other agency that Alistair and his wife started and have run. Actually, I completely forgot to mention, we've got an awesome offer for your listeners. Just for the first few months, we're going to have available a 60% discount on the course. So if people go to class-pr.com forward slash HTE, you'll be able to get a special access to the course there because we know that your listeners are awesome and I think they'd they'd get a huge amount of value from this. So it's, uh, yeah, that is a crazy deal. (laughs) Wow, that's awesome. Thank you. So class.pr.com slash... Class-pr.com slash HTE. There we go. I can't say it very well, but I will (laughs) link to it in the show notes. So it's there for you. In fact, you can open up your iPhone or whatever you're listening to on right now. And the link is right in the show notes there. Alistair, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure. Thanks for reaching out with a great pitch, getting onto the show, making that first 20 words, not something I want to just delete. (laughs) And go away. Thanks for sharing so openly about your story and what you've been up to and you're going to do. And yeah, just please keep doing what you're doing, man, because it's awesome to watch. Well, it's such a pleasure for having me on. Thanks so much for having us on the show today, John. It's been a real joy. And I, know I love listening to your show. So a uh, big fan. So uh, keep it up. I will. Thanks. Cheers, John. I'd like to take a moment and tell you about my sponsor, Design Crowd. Design Crowd is a website that helps entrepreneurs and small businesses like yourself outsource or crowdsource custom graphic, logo, and web design from designers around the world. Design Crowd has more than 550,000 designers from over 100 countries, all ready to help you with any creative and design projects you might have. Plus, they have a very cool offer just for you as a Hack the Entrepreneur listener. Check out designcrowd.com slash hack. That's D-E-S-I-G-N-C-R-O-W-D, designcrowd.com slash hack for a special exclusive VIP offer for Hack the Entrepreneur listeners. All right. All right. That was a lot of fun. In fact, I think it was so much fun that we should actually go back to it. We should go back. Let's go through everything that Alistair said, and let's find the one thing, that one thing that stood out to you and to me. You ready? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. You learn how to write a genuinely newsworthy press release, which is in fact a news story. And so more often than not, it's pretty much copy and pasted into your target media or or slightly tweaked for your target blog, depending on the tone, because you need to know how to have that top line, that intro of like 20 words max that completely articulates your story, not in a hyperbolic way, but in a way that is compelling and completely grabs somebody's attention. And that's the hack. Alistair, Alistair, Alistair. So I want to, I guess, disclaim that, I mean, he does mention at the very beginning of it that it's part of a service with Class PR that he sells, and that's not what this is about. Not to detract from it, I just haven't taken his course, but I really, really, really value and was intrigued by this statement. Because, because I receive a ton of press releases. I've seen a ton of press releases. I've been part of companies that have created them. And they're almost always done wrong. Because they're done, well, one thing Alistair mentioned, that hyperbolic way where you're just talking nonsense and spewing out words. But it's not focused on the fact that that press release should be able to be turned into and almost copy and pasted and published on their blog or in their magazine or wherever it is you are wanting your, your company to be promoted in or talked about. And so you don't need to use words that 
are nonsense and stuff. You need to actually just tell the true story of your business and you need to put it, like he says, in those first 20 words, that lead, right? We talked about this in copywriting or when you're writing for a blog, you need that lead. It's a news thing to really catch people to make them want to read further. Your news release or your press release needs to be written in this same way, right? And so you need to learn how to genuinely create that press release to make it compelling and completely grab someone's attention without the hyperbolic way and knowing that it should be able to be used directly. So this hack, if you will, is it doesn't give you all the answers, but to me, it, it really like turned a light on into how you should even be thinking about positioning your business, your product, your service, yourself, whatever it is you're trying to get into the media's attention, which we should all be doing, but it, it really just, it's a mindset shift of thinking about it. Thinking about you're not just trying to like put together this one page that's going to just knock the socks off of the journalist. So when she opens it up in her email, she can be like, oh my God, this is amazing. We need to make their jobs easier. And we need to create it in that way with that first 20 words, like Alistair says, and then create the press release so that she can just literally tweak some words to make it fit the voice of whatever publication she writes for, and then can just publish it. People are busy. The people do need stories. And so it's our job as the entrepreneur, as the creator behind to make sure our story gets told in the correct way. Alistair, I'm sure can help you with this. If not, there's, it's a great way to think about it and just go online now and do some research in thinking about press releases in this way. Alistair, thank you. All right. Well, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. Talking Alistair with his two companies, but then also getting to talk about sort of the positioning and story behind our companies. It was fascinating to me. And I think it's a really, really, really essential skill that a lot of us look overlook when building our businesses and trying to grow the brands around them. But it's something that we, we either need to focus on as the entrepreneurs behind them, or we need to get people in place to do that. And I think Alistair really touched upon a lot and really helped us sort of see that. So it was, it was good. It was fun. And I hope you dig it. So it's been fun. I've taken enough of your time. It's been great to have you once again. Thanks so much for joining me. And please, until next time, keep hacking the entrepreneur. Oh, <laughs>